continue. Can you take it in our team? Can I take it in our team? Aww. Aww. Look at this. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Hello everyone who's listening. I'll just wait another minute. I've got a little helper here for our Wednesday devotional. So if he has any theological thoughts, he will chime in. But I'll just H wait a couple more minutes and then we'll dive in. H-U-N-T-E-H-E. Hope you've all had a good Wednesday. It's always a bit weird having a conversation with yourself, but good to <laughs> see you all. On Okay, a couple more people logging in, so I will dive in. Um, hi, Mom. Yeah, they're all listening. So do you want to say hi, hun? Do you want to say hi? Mm. Okay, well, Hunter's um, he's very keen to hear the devotionals, so um, he'll be part of it. And if, as I just said before, if he has anything theological to add, he'll contribute. Um, so hi, everyone. Thanks for connecting in. I've titled this devotional we Weary Wednesdays. Um, not to say that Wednesdays always have to be weary, but it is hump day. And in a meeting today, someone said at the very end of the meeting, hope you all have a good weekend. I do. And I thought, oh, yeah. And then I thought, it's Wednesday. <laughs> we all laughed. And yeah, you wrote your name. Good job. And we all went, oh, yeah, I'm sometimes Wednesdays. Down. You wish it was Friday. Um, but we've still got two more days to go. So sometimes Wednesdays can be a bit of a... Or only halfway through the week, we've still got two days to go. So I've called it Weary Wednesday. And I think that we can all feel weary, whether it's just sitting on the lounge on a Wednesday, thinking tired enough that you're it's a Friday, um, or whether it's more that weariness in life. I was reflecting about when you're working in a job or you're working at a relationship. I'm not seeing. You have to be quiet. Yeah, they're all listening. And um or perhaps you've been fighting for something and you're just weary. You're tired of fighting. You don't feel like you're getting anywhere or you're carrying a burden and you're just weary. And perhaps that's how you're feeling right now. You're feeling tired or exhausted or maybe even weary in life. And today I want to look at 1 Kings 19. And it's the story of the prophet Elijah. And there's this moment in 1 Kings 19 where Elijah sits down under a tree and he says, it's enough. He says, Lord, take away my life, for I'm no better than my father's. It's enough. And I don't know if you've ever uttered those words out, out loud, but I'm sure many of you have probably thought it, where you've just thought, it's enough. I'm tired of fighting. I'm tired of doing this. I'm tired of carrying this weight, of pushing for this relationship or working for this job. It's enough. And... The wonderful thing about the prophets in the Bible is that unlike what we might have heard growing up in Sunday school, so often these prophets aren't heroes, they're just people like us. And Elijah sits down under this tree, exhausted, and says, it's enough. Now that would make a lot of sense if Elijah had been fighting a hard battle, or perhaps God had felt distant and he didn't know if God was at work in his life. But actually... Elijah utters these words right after he has seen this incredible display of God's power and might. Many of you will be familiar with the scene, but let me set it for you. Um, it's back in 1 Kings 18, and there is a king called King Ahab in control of the land and of God's people. And it says that King Ahab was the most evil king out of all the kings. And his wife Jezebel particularly hated God's people. And it says that um, Jezebel actually had gone and killed lots of God's people. And there were about 100 prophets, 100 um, prophets of God that were hiding in caves because they were worried that they were going to be killed by Queen Jezebel. And there's also a drought. They've been in drought for about three years. There hasn't been a drop of rain. But then the word of the Lord comes to Elijah. And you know that things are always going to happen when the word of the Lord comes. And so Elijah then goes and he gathers all the people together 
and he challenges all the prophets of Baal to a bit of a showdown. You guys will remember this story, but in front of all the people, there's one guy, Elijah, one prophet of God, and 450 prophets of the false god Baal, who the king and the queen serve. And so he gets them both to set up their altars and they both get a, a bull and they put them on the altar. And he says, okay, you call out to your God and then I will call out to mine. And whoever's God consumes the bull with fire, they are the true God. And so the prophets from Baal go first. And these 450 prophets start calling out to this false god Baal and they're crying out to him. They start cutting themselves and bleeding because that's what they do. And they're going on and carrying about trying to get Baal to set this bull alight. And Elijah acts like a bit of an Aussie and he walks around mocking them. And he says in 1 Corinthians 18, cry aloud for he is a God. Either he is musing or he is relieving himself or he is on a journey or perhaps he is asleep and must be awakened. Being a true Australian, paying them out. But from morning until midday, these 450 prophets try everything that they can to get their king, their, their God to act but nothing happens. So then they hand it over to Elijah. So Elijah has his altar. And just to really show that he is the underdog, he says to them, fill up four jars of water. And I want you to pour mm. the water on top of the altar. And then he says, do it again. And then he says, do it again. So he's really showing off now. And then he prays this powerful prayer to God. He says, God of Abraham, Lord of Isaac and Israel, let it be known this day that you are God in Israel and that I am your servant and that I have done all these things at your word. Answer me, O Lord, answer me, that this people may know that you, O Lord, are God, God, and that you have turned their hearts back. And then in 1 Kings 18, 38, it says, then the fire of the Lord fell and consumes the burnt offering and the wood and the stone and the dust and licked up all the water that was in the trenches. And when all the people saw it, they fell on their faces and said, the Lord, he is God, the Lord, he is God. So Elijah has won this battle against all these prophets of Baal. The underdog has succeeded. He has come through. The Lord is God. All the people have fallen on their faces. So then all the prophets of Baal flee and then Elijah heads off in victory for the God has come and shown his miraculous power and burned up this altar. But what's fascinating then is what happens next. Then God sends rain on the earth and again he shows what a mighty God he is in control of all of heaven and earth and nature itself. But then Queen Jezebel finds out what's happened. She finds out that her prophets of this false God have been defeated. So she sends a messenger to Elijah and she threatens to kill him. She says in 1 Kings chapter 19, So may the gods do to me and more also if I do not make your life as the life of one of them by this time tomorrow. So it says in verse 3 that Elijah was afraid. So he rose and ran for his life and went into the wilderness. So Elijah has just had this powerful display of God. This underdog has come out victorious against all these prophets. And then his life is threatened by the queen and he runs for his life and he goes into hiding in the wilderness. And it's amazing how quickly we can forget what God has done in our lives and how he works so powerfully. I mean, God has shown that he is king over heaven and earth, that he is ruler even over the rain falling down, fire coming um, from the sky. And yet Elijah runs afraid away from this woman Jezebel. Jezebel. And as I said before, I love that these prophets in the Bible, they aren't heroes, they're just people like you and I. And everything that's going through Elijah's head isn't logical. If he was actually using his brain, he would think, oh, hang on a sec, the same God that just brought fire down on the altar and defeated those 450 prophets is the same one who can protect me from these threats of life from this uh, against the queen. That if God wants to carry his mission on through me, then he can protect me from this one woman because, look, he just defeated 450 um, prophets of this false God. But it's not, he's not thinking logically because he's overcome by his emotions. 
And the same is true for us. We think, how could Elijah be on this high praying to God and calling on him to come and act with fire and might and power and then the very next day be afraid and running from his life from this woman? But we can follow that same roller coaster because our emotions aren't logical. They aren't thinking in a theological way and understanding who God is. And sometimes when our emotions are telling us certain things, we need to remind ourselves of who God is, what he's done in our lives, that he is in control, that he is mighty and powerful, and even call to mind the things that he has done. We may not have seen him pour fire from heaven to burn up a bull, but we can all name things in our life from the first time that we became a Christian of how God has worked miraculously in our life. So Elijah sits under a tree and he says, it is enough, Lord, take away my life for I am no better than my father's. He lay down and slept under the tree. Now, when he says that, does God come to him and say, come on, Elijah, pull your head in. Did you just see what I did back there? That was even more impressive than Michael Jordan on the basketball court. Come on, stop throwing a pity party for yourself. Pull your socks up, get back to work. No, no. God doesn't respond when Elijah calls out to him and says he's tired, he's exhausted, he's weary, it's enough. I mean, Elijah's pretty dramatic and full on here. He says, take my life. He asks that he might die. And for, for some of us, when you are so weary, you just want an escape. You just want it to end. And that's exactly where Elijah is at, despite the fact that he's seen this amazing victory. He says, this is too hard. I can't go on living. So how does God respond? He bakes him a cake. It says that as Elijah was sleeping, an angel touched him and said to him, arise and eat. And he looked and behold, and there was at his head a cake baked on hot stones and a jar of water. And he ate and drank and lay down again. See, I love that when Elijah was weary and tired, God didn't judge him. He cared for him. He cared for his physical needs. And I think when we're weary and tired, we need to remember that God is a God who cares about our whole being and that often the most important theological and spiritual thing that we can do is take a nap like my poor little boy's about to have now. He wants us to rest and to look after us. And so that's what God does for Elijah. But then what happens? So then he has the food and he has enough strength to go on a journey to Mount Horeb. And Mount Horeb is also um, called Mount Sinai. And so Elijah goes up to Mount Sinai. And Mount Sinai, as many of you remember, is where God gave Moses the Ten Commandments. And so Elijah is going to meet with God. So what happens there? He goes and meets with him and God says to Elijah, what are you doing here? And Elijah says, I've been jealous for the Lord. I've been working hard. I've been doing all that I can. He says, but for the people of Israel have forsaken your covenant. They've thrown down your altars, killed your prophets. And I, even I only am left and they seek my life to take it away. Again, Elijah keeps thinking about himself. He's forgotten the God that he serves. He's forgotten this mighty God who's worked powerfully in his life. And then many of you will remember the story. When he's up on the mountain, behold, the Lord passed by and a great wind comes through, but, the God, but God was not in the wind. And an earthquake comes through, but God was not in the earthquake. And a fire comes through, but God was not in the fire. And what God is saying to Elijah here is that I can work in mighty acts. I can pour down fire from heaven to light an altar. But don't miss my small, quiet voice because it says, and then after the fire, there was the sound of a low, quiet whisper. And behold, there came a voice to him that said, what are you doing here, Elijah? And God asked him this question twice because he's displayed the character of God to him. And he wants him to understand that even if God isn't acting in mighty, powerful ways, he is still at work that sometimes he might act with fire from heaven, but sometimes he might act with a slow, quiet whisper, an encouragement from a friend, a prompt from the word of God, a reminder of what he has called you to. And so he asked Elijah the same question, but Elijah has the same answer. 
he hasn't listened to what God is trying to say. He says, I've been jealous for you, but even I am left. So again, how does God respond to what Elijah has to say? He doesn't say, stop throwing the pity party again. I thought we'd gotten over that. No, he calls him back to the mission. He says, go, return on your way to the wilderness and then anoint Hazael to be king over Syria and then Elisha, the son of Jasaphat, to anoint a prophet in your place. And what God is saying to Elijah is that there is no plan B. He says the mission continues. And that's the word of God for us today. When we're weary, when we're exhausted, remember that God wants to care for your physical self. And then he wants to meet with you. He wants you to go to the mountain or the cupboard or the breakfast table to meet with him because he wants to remind you who he is. He wants you to shift your thinking from you onto him, the God who is mighty and powerful and in control, even when we can't see it, even when we can't see fire coming from heaven or earthquakes or winds. God is still at work in that still quiet voice, in the word of God, in the whispers of the Psalms and the the song of Solomon and the, the words spoken over us. God is still at work. And then finally, he wants us to return to the mission, to remember that God's people are the way that he is enacting his purpose on the earth. There is no plan B. So when we're weary and tired, come back to God, remember the mission, continue the work, get your strength from him and he will carry you along. Hope you have a wonderful Wednesday. Better put this little one to bed. Thanks for being with us. See ya.